the whole course we structured in the way so we'll get some boring theoretical material from Jeff or me, then practical from guys and again boring. So it keep, keeps you in some kind of a mood. Uh, this is all about uh, big data layout today. There's lots of pictures. Initially to understand how deep should I go, can you raise hand if you work with big data stack, data engineer? I know. Uh, uh, big data itself, um, it's not about the size of the data. It's about time to process specific size. So big data is when you need to process uh, one megabyte in milliseconds simultaneously. Everything that needs distributed or parallel processing. Right now it's considered big data. Previously it wasn't that clear. Everyone thought if I don't have a five terabytes, it's not big data. For data in REST, yes, you don't need big data stack for gigabytes. For terabytes, you don't need big data stack. On the other hand, if you process in stock market data from uh, trading platforms, you need a parallel processing. Otherwise, you lost. You get a delay in uh, processing. So, Cool. I have one person that can help me with and correct me when I make mistakes. So let's move on. Focus. Goal is uh, you're gonna hear today like at least 50 different names of frameworks and tools. The goal is not to remember like anything of that. Goal is to build awareness that toolbox is white, what it has represented, which are the most noticeable pros and cons of every tool. So whenever you get in a practical task, a requirement to deal with a challenge they're gonna mention, or just something similar, at least you'll understand where you've heard about it, what's present here. If it helps you anyhow, anything in any other way, perfect. The content. So we'll start looking on the big picture. Then we'll look into a smaller picture and text. We'll repeat it. Look another cool picture and then another cool picture. Okay, getting serious. Uh, we'll get big data landscape. Then we'll get this landscape in a whole, take pieces and we'll go piece by piece reviewing each of them, explaining why it's needed, what it does, what's noticeable players, and who you don't want to deal with, really. Like, throw it away, right away. Then, uh, each section I will uh, end with the tips from practice. Something really painful or revealing that might help or sell, save you a few weeks of work, if you will start working on it. At the end, I'll show you example how all tools been tied together in architecture of real products. Some of them from our company, others not, because some of our clients signed NDA. Landscape, cool picture. I need someone who's gonna tell me what's wrong with this picture. Any ideas, any suggestions? Even stupid, huh? Right. It's incorrect. <laughs> That's what we deal right now. And I want you to understand the level of changes at 2012, 2018. Frustrating, yeah? In order to be and at least understand what's going on, can you imagine the amount of tools, materials you have to uh, read to understand what happens, releases, etc. Still, this is kind of strange because when you see it first time, don't try to look on details. I'll give you a detailed view in a second. <laughs> Just in a general, it should provide a general review. The problem is this overview. When you look on this, you see, ooh, cool, so much. But when you start looking details on each section, it turns out that the person that was creating this item, they not, don't really know what they're talking about. I'll show examples later. And for example, each of these 
component like category has at least from one to four other competitors missing. Not small competitors, real competitors, production that you can use already. Sometimes even better that's listed. So anytime that someone refers to this uh, tool or graphics, don't take it as an instance, completely true. It's always should be taken in some level of, I don't know, verification. Even though today we are talking about data engineers, so I'll make it easier. That's all extremely expensive products, usually affordable by enterprises and companies that don't really need it. AI analytics, you will study on your classes. You have separate tons of it. I'll concentrate on open source. It's available for stuff for everyone, for data engineering as a baseline and infrastructure just provided. So to data engineering. Yesterday, Jeff already started talking about it. The biggest challenge with uh, distributed processing is need to address and work with the cluster or set of machines in a way as it's a single machines or at least treatable as a single machine. So for that, you need a set of different tools that combines in some ecosystem. First of all, you need file system that lays underneath everything. Distributed file system, you'll get. On top of the distributed file system, you need something that coordinate distribution of resources on file system, on files, on memory, disk, CPUs. Then you need orchestration, something that controls who's been off, who's getting up, who's getting down, what nodes should be up, should be down, blah, 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 blah. All, everything that needs to orchestrate load of the cluster. On top of that, usually you either need, you need a storage, but that's either analytical long-term storage where you have petabytes of data and that's really nice for models training or you need uh, data in motion, storage that keeps frequent operational data. And everything I'm gonna be talking today is about distributed. So I'm not talking about MySQL. It doesn't support distributed storage. It supports sharding, but that's not it, absolutely. So even if you're talking about operational storage, there's gonna be distributed storages because you're gonna need them, especially when you're gonna be building microservices, models that being trained distributed, if you don't know, Tian and Coffee already supports it on GPU clusters, distributed training on neural networks. TensorFlow is kind of behind on distribution. Then, on based on storage, you need some kind of access, how you access the data. Remember, all data is distributed. To access it, usually you need to MapReduce beneath the abstraction of the language you're dealing with. And then you somehow need to deal with this data engine to process, run analytics, Spark. That's usually where it lays so. uh, What else in uh, this ecosystem? Then you need logging. And if you think logging is simple task for cluster, you're mistaken. You get in different places, in different time, generated files with different information. You need to sync up, combine, merge, usually in real time or at least in some uh, regular basis. It's hard task as well. Monitoring, again, can you imagine like cluster of 1000 nodes that sending hard bits to one another node? Your network is going to die with the hard bits every second, with full set of information. Anything you deal with has some challenges. And then at the end is the streaming, that's like next level of challenge because on top of <laughs> Software programming languages with moving windows, etc. You have uh, questions about minimizing delays, minimizing latency between nodes, what to install, who can process 1,000 in milliseconds, who can process 100,000 in milliseconds. Depends on the task. Anything? After each section, we're going to stop. Any questions, we can ask, or we can ask later.
baseline. Frankly speaking, baseline, there are two major, no matter what baselines, especially in open source, Hadoop and Mises. Mises, it's, they created their operating system called uh, Data Center uh, Operating System, DCOS. They have their own file system, their own orchestration, their own uh, coordination, really cool. The problem with Mises, the support policy they started. Uh, they kind of low on changes. Hadoop is already 3.1. So open source Hadoop is evolving faster than a donated open source product with a support from single organization. And that's the problem with it. So for example, in the start of 2017, you would rather go Mises over the Hadoop. Right now, Hadoop is far more better than Mises. And that's it. Uh, comparing to Hadoop, that's cl cloud solution, but they're going to be touched in the next few slides. Together with HDFS, this file system, we have all solutions from different cloud providers. They really earn money on this. That's why cloud providers started to provide their own services that mimics main functionality of Hadoop ecosystem. S3 from AWS, blob storage from Azure. I haven't found an icon for Google file system, and that's the problem with Google. First of all, no icons for their product. Secondly, the naming of product is awful. Like they call data flow, Google data flow. They call data system, Google file system. It's not interesting. You're already used to, to deal with some zoo of different technologies, and you're expecting something strange, another elephant or tiger or something else. On top of everything of that, MapReduce is one of the baseline. Nothing really has changed, only streaming has shifted a bit the logic of dealing with the data. But streaming deals with data in operation system, usually processing all messages. Yarn, it's uh, yet another resource negotiator. Jeff mistaken one word yesterday. That's uh, uh, coordination within the cluster. Has another alternative for yarn, but yarn is better from our perspective. Spark is baseline as well as engine, and the reason is that's the most widely spread engine to do run any kind of transformation analytics over state. It's easy to use. It's, it was faster at the moment it was uh, released, and learning curve was a lot lower than storm so storm by default far more far better tool, tool for everything you do in spark way better but the level learning curve you need to start using it and the time you need to deploy it configure etc is bigger that's example when the better product fails to the worst product iphones android huh? i'll be trying to make a call of war eventually so as we're talking about Hadoop as the leading one today, that's an example from uh, this, uh, this pretty correct one. So these two guys on the previous week announced a merge. And I had a hard time defining how to call that column with them. Cortendera or uh, Cloudworks? Kind of question. MapR is the third one. It was considered as uh, the least used distribution of Hadoop. They all open source, keep it in mind. So we can easily download them, start playing. It's kind of easy, especially all of them have sandbox. You can install it on their own machine. If it's kind of powerful, it emulates four working nodes, you go. But the problem is there was a Gartner uh, review recently. MapR has market share higher than both Cloudera and Hortonworks combined. The reaction was, what? Really? No one tried MAPAR. And the problem, not problem, success of theirs lies in the models they choose. They started looking first on enterprise. They even offer you community editions that's been Hadoop cut in a half with some functionality and enterprise. Mm -hmm. Support everything shuffled with tons of tools, 
enterprise, comparing three of them was taking more power as is. Others, kind of specific. <coughs> Jetra and Blue Data were starting running, but they're still running. So they're catching up, but even not close. Hadoop in the cloud, I believe you're gonna start from this one. Unless you have two, three days for your time, for working nodes, and a lot of love to console. Then you can start deploying Hadoop on premises first time. Before that, I recommend starting getting familiar on cloud. Why? P, close of that. That's overview what they provide, and I started from premises and then cloud deployments. So cloud era, the most interesting for data scientists distribution. And the reason is simple, Impala. Impala is a query engine that is blazing fast. It's the fastest query engine in Hadoop distribution so far. And whenever you need complex analytics, uh, queries, etc., you use Impala. Hortworks released their uh, Hive LLAP or Hive 2.0 in order to compete with Impala and to get some share of market. But eventually, so we did comparison of them running on production. <laughs> it's always, you know, cool Hive Impala. Oh, it's so high Impala. They never catch up to each other. So they're good, but it's not bad. What's good with Cloudera? They have manager that helps you install and see cluster in a hole in one UI. It's called Hume with nice graphics, really nice. And they have the, one of the coolest data science toolkits. Problem with it, their dependencies always suck. Sorry. <clears throat> Can we cut out this <laughs> from recording? Whenever you deploy, for example, Spark 2.1, you need Spark 2.1 in Cloudera, it's 1.6. <coughs> and so on and so on and so on. If you need latest dependency, don't go with Cloudera. Hortonworks, on the other hand, the distribution that has the most recent dependencies always. Secondly, it has Ambari. I started my work in 2012 with Cloudera. I really hated it. The reason we really spent two weeks deploying it, first time, no, no, no C, no instruction. And then in, in a year, I saw Hortonworks with Ambari. You just click, it deploys, and there is a UI where you can see all nodes, everything running, graphics, you don't need to do anything. It was so cool. And it's developing and developing and developing. I have to say that Ambari right now, you can use separately for, it's already went to a separate project. It's, it can be used independent to Hadoop. It's really cool. You can even use it for deployment and uh, review of different other services, Hadoop independent. Then, Hortonworks went in different directions. They concentrated on data governance and data security. So they offer it Ranger, Atlas, something else, but it's not so widely used. This is something others started to develop, but they're not even close to Hortonworks. And then, Hortonworks invested in HDF platform, Horton Data Flow, Hortonworks Data Flow, sorry, almost as Google. Um, it's really cool. It's built on top of NiPy that yesterday Jeff was mentioning. And whenever you need ETL, I beg you, forget about Pentaho, what's else, on Infosphere, etc. Use it. Open source, solid as I don't know, rock, and it works works in distributed manner, it doesn't fall. We have a production cluster with running for one year with zero accidents. That's not common situation. And last one, they have a drill. That's their unique instrument. You can get latest version of which you can get in MAPAR distribution. And the coolest thing about drill, it's uh, abstraction over lower implementation. Independently of a storage and file system, Drill can query anything. And that's his biggest power and the reason why it was adopted in enterprise as well. In enterprise, we have like huge variety of different storages. 
databases, file system, Excel files. You can't imagine how many data is stored in Excel files yet. And it can query them, and then you can do everything with it. Also, it was, they took a course on data scientists. It has the best toolkit comparing to Cloudera, but it, it is paid, so it depends. Whether you're lucky and enterprise or company uh, so decided to go with Mapar, if not, you go with Cloudera. Or if not, you go to Hadoop on cloud. That is the reason why Hortonworks and Cloudera started merging. The pressing comp competition from uh, clouds. Clouds started wrapping Hadoop or separate services to be able to product, provide software as a service, Hadoop as a service. So you don't care about machines, really. You just see number of machines as a Dropbox, etc. All you care, you just deploy. You don't care about DevOpsing, configuration, etc. So the biggest effort, whenever you choose between premise and uh, cloud, uh, cloud uh, implementation of Hadoop, it's whether you have or no time for DevOps or do you have or no DevOps. Right now, for example, we are getting requests for project with a requirement like we don't need, we don't want to have a de separate DevOps. So it's that strictly no to any on premises because. On-premises have a better toolkit. All cloud solutions are limited in some way. Remember this always. They can be limited on power, they can be limited on versions, they can be limited on what storages you can use. But on-premises, you can do everything, like completely. But it's always come at cost. You need a separate person to do this. So short review of uh, cloud. EMR, HD Insights, Data Pro. I'm not sure, we haven't yet flipped a coin for this course, which one we're gonna use, AWS or Google. So you definitely won't, don't want to use Azure, Azure, but it's also cool. So EMR, easy to stop, a few clicks. Raw Hadoop distribution, so it doesn't use any distribution, Hortonworks, et cetera, et cetera. So again, the problem with dependencies, uh, low outdated dependencies persist. EMR, for example, doesn't still have something with Spark called, just recently noticed. But you can also deploy an EMR cluster, Kafka, Flink, HBase, Spark, and Presto. And that's it, nothing else, limited. You will see later, there is a huge list of databases and storages. You can just pick the best fitting for you. But you can deploy in the EMR. You'll need it. Huh? Sorry, can you want this to be query? Uh, no, it doesn't work. That's direct competitors. Oh, BigQuery, open source edition. You need to install an EC2 instance, mm -hmm. not an AWS EMR cluster. That's a big difference. So yeah. you'll have to have a DevOps. On EC2 instance, you can deploy WordPress if you have time. So no one controls you what you're doing. Without time, you can do it. It's very easy to. I mean, we are talking about EC2. Yeah. EC2, you can, yeah. if you have AMI in the image prepared, it's easy, but then you need to configure it for your project. And that takes time, for a lot of time. In, for example, you were counting, HBase have around 1,000 configuration properties. And DevOps is persons that know at least 10% of it, or the most affecting 10%. You can't keep in mind everything. You have to Google every time. HD Insights, so just for understanding, AWS and HDS and Azure are leading right now clouds. Google wasn't paying attention to cloud world for a long time. Just last year, they started rapidly catching up. So they started releasing, the price is the lowest right now. So if you're talking about prices, go Google. They, go in, com in competition mode so they get huge discounts on their pricing. Sorry, but my, is it this disadvantage is that Google, um, you'll use with Google BigQuery and it's expensive to query in data from it, but you can use for us to You can, if you use Google BigQuery as a part of data proc, it can be comp uh, costly, but pre you can deploy a press on an instance and uh, connect a cluster to it and no problem. 
So it's all conditional. It's all like a Lego, usually. All the stacks you can combine. You'll see it later in architecture, how all of them being stick together in different positions. So, and if you're talking about this, integration, you just deploy it easily, choosing what you're gonna use without additional cost. That's the most uh, advantage that gives you the cloud distribution. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah. Are those solutions are free with some limited? Uh, Open source? Yeah. Completely free. Uh, I can cloud, uh, uh, all paid? Yes. So you use, uh, this one for example is extremely uh, costly. It costs one 100 bucks per day for a small cluster. I don't know why. This one is not so costly, especially if you're gonna use on spot instances, spot instances. They will be damn cheap. This one was also cheap because of the pricing model right now. But you have to pay. So, and you cannot deploy them locally, so in cloud. That's in general it. So with production, better go with it. The reason is level amount of support. You get in described manuals, everything, created AMIs, etc. If you are in Microsoft infrastructure, better this one because of support of uh, Microsoft stack, uh, MSSQL server native support, easy to deploy, storage is easy convertible. Google, if you want to save money. No, really, but the level of support is low, so there is not a lot of instructions really problems. People just start in deploying this in production. But for example, if you're in a startup, you can come to Google say, I'm a startup, but I really want to use your cloud over AWS. They will grant you a huge package. Really. They're really trying to stick their cloud into this competition. On Hadoop distributions, what questions you have? And I have touched the just highest of the iceberg. Like in each distribution, there are tons of items. Yes. Yeah, would it make sense to like host your own cluster? Yes. I, I mean, when? When? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I just don't pay for any part. Oh. Data security. First item: data security. Thank you. Half the company won't ever migrate to cloud. Secondly. Remember yesterday, Jeff told about FOC. Uh, FOC, FOC computing, the new trend that goes like uh, enlarging the cloud. So the problem with cloud is in order to get some computational uh, power, you need to send your data to the cloud. If you're talking about data science or big data stack, can you imagine sending all data from stock market to a cloud? People previously were deploying data on Wall Street, data servers closer to servers of stock exchange just to get latency low. And now we're talking send everything to cloud. So there is a move. If you have data intensive generation, place uh, powers the closer to source the better. And it goes even further with IoT blow, blossoming. So our car navigation, they starting to think about placing small servers in a machines to process video on flight without need to constant internet connections. IoT sensors, plants, when you have a sensor of temperature, flow, et cetera, you need to process them immediately without latency of throwing them. And the problem with um, clouds you pay not just for instances, but you separately pay for a networking. And if you're network intensive, I, I call them surprise uh, letters because at the end of the month, your bill is four times higher, five times higher, depending how intensive it is. So you know the cost upfront of the server, but you have no idea what the cost of uh, networking gonna be, especially if some developer got a mistake. <laughs> Yeah, some cases. <coughs> Moving to coordination. It's easier because there is a common leader 
that being sticked everywhere. Apache Zookeeper. Mm -hmm. And it does everything needed. It's it also originate was in the ecosystem, Hadoop ecosystem, but right now can be used away from it. Apache Ambari from Hortonworks, I already mentioned, it has also capabilities to monitor and coordinate, but far less. Thrift is another open source competitor for alternative for Zookeeper, but they both open source. It's the reason is mainly in a problem. You run in a problem with some kind of some instrument, the best way is to try alternative. They may start working right away without additional fixes, etc. Talent for some reason is this place. I can't call it coordination. Really. It's data transfer, ETL, some level of uh, data flow, analytics and workflows, but not coordination. Sorry guys, but you're mistaken there. Uzi, it's a workflow manager in Hadoop, also helps coordinate, build the workflows of MapReduce jobs. Hue, competitor for Ambari from Cloudera. I really hope they're gonna combine them together and Ambari will have a nice graphics and visual buttons that will be really cool. Uh, Apache Airflow, the same as Uzi. So it's really more a question what you like more. But for coordination, you always go with the people. And I listed it there in uh, recommendations. In general, if you don't want to pay money and you have limited amount of money and powerful computer, you need Hadoop, go with Sandbox from Cortinworks. Uh, well, there are uh, cool, cool practical advice. Uzi, if you have a project on the AWS, try not to use Uzi. It works great, but not with AWS and S3. Really, Uzi is all about Hadoop distribution. When you try to use it with uh, AWS file system, it's a nightmare. And for ETL, if someone asks you, we need to move files from one direction from another and then enrich file with something, you ask, should it be done in milliseconds? No, okay, use SniFi. Uh, if it should be done in milliseconds, uh, that's a completely different story we're gonna be talking later. The hardest part, data storages. As I already just mentioned, we need to store data somewhere and we need also a way to access it. And Really, people are lazy. So there was a move in 2010s and further saying SQL is bad, let's develop something else. And tons of dialects were created, like they were powerful, they were making cool things. And then the business came and said, can you give me the same but with SQL and that was kind of a turning point. It was like, really? SQL, okay. And everyone started to build up a semi-SQL or SQL-like syntax on top of the product. Someone succeeded, someone not. So, and the best example is Hive. Hive is, uh, I can call it something like SQL-like storage or representation of the data that supports SQL-like language for querying. So it makes data that's laying in the files throughout your cluster in a tabular view used for people that work with RDBMS for a long time, and you can query it as well. Underneath, it uses MapReduce, but you don't see it. Spark configure it in query, but it's not really a query, it's processing, but you can query easily data with it. Drill, I already mentioned. It's something that's independent of the storage. HDFS, S3, HBase, Hive, everything. It can query. Speed is different, remembers it. But still, it's really powerful. Slam data is kind of new one. It's just one year. But popularity is growing. And the reason is that is abstraction for cloud storages. The problem with cloud they want to marry you to their cloud. 
you use their service, you're in. You know, that's for whole life till the death, etc. The problem is their services work only with their services, nothing else. Or you can use open source, but on separate instance, then you don't uh, have a service. This thing, Slam Data, makes it cloud agnostic. You develop a product, you install this item, and the client comes to say, it's too expensive. No problem, let's migrate. That makes it easier. That's why it's starting to be so popular. It's like, you know, the move against the cloud. <laughs> Funny to see. The main site, cloud there in Pala, the coolest one access, and the fastest one. And then we have, you see they call it data access. Well, this whole is data storage is really. And that is all, except Flume. Flume is for uh, logs moving. And they find it? Mm -hmm. Scoop as well. It's kind of strange. Um, that's all long-term storages that store huge amounts of data. Even MongoDB. I'm not a fan of MongoDB, so excuse me. Uh, and in uh, uh, big data world, if you're talking about on-premises and Hadoop, it always comes to the choice between HBase and Cassandra. If you're talking about huge data sets, and huge is from at least 50 terabytes, not even more. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Cassandra is really nice, usually faster than HBase. But the problem is Cassandra, it's eventually consistent. So if you're, again, distributed cluster, storage, etc., they need somehow give you guarantee that whenever you access, give you access and this access uh, request goes to a specific node, this node will have the same data or replica of data as the other node while you're writing to third node. And the problem with Cassandra, it says, yeah, for sure there is consistently, but it eventually, we do not guarantee consistency within one second. We may guarantee it will be consistent within an hour. So it, it's called eventual consistency and very tricky thing. If you don't need eventual consistency, it's a better choice and easier to use because HBase requires more knowledge of design, database design. It requires, and the problem is you can access and write data by key, row, in, row key. And you need to design it, and you cannot then access data like an SQL by different other fields. You, design, you access it by your raw ID you design. But there are, ways, there are ways to improve it. I'll show you later. Another thing, usually it's based on data in terms of storage huge data sets. It's based on even driven technology. Hmm? Not really sure here. I'm more, you know, practical. But we use both of them in our life. Other than that, in production, HDB can be used, document storage as well as one BBP, but Two specific projects, both both works. NiPy is not storage, so nothing really to talk about here. A uh, few advices here. This one is also Presto engine to work with high edge based on high. And then, as always, we have uh, alternatives from cloud providers that provide you as a service, so you have to pay for them. And as you mentioned, I specifically dis distributed them for high motion storage and for analytical low, sto low motion storage. When you usually either write data a lot and then do complex queries, 
In AWS, it's you write for S3 plus Athena, or use Redshift. Redshift is expensive as hell. So usually, if you don't need a response within a second, just use S3 and Athena is gonna be cheap. Uh, for Azure, it's a SQL data warehouse. For Google, well, <laughs> cloud storage. Again, naming, killing, killing us. High motion, DynamoDB, Aurora. Again, Redshift can be used as well, you know, both type of storages, but that's why it's so expensive. DynamoDB is also expensive and it's built on based on PrestoDB, open source. Huh? So you can use PrestoDB instead of DynamoDB, but then you need to manage it. An instance on EC2. The biggest difference. That's it. As you can read later, it's more for noticeable. That is something that emerged, you know, in US SQL databases. Like, well, it's all new, it's better in something, in some one point is better, it's getting huge advertisement, but really, we in the practice don't see adoption that much. The most adoption I've seen is MariaDB, only because it's a fork of MySQLDB, and everyone knows MySQLDB, it's easy to adopt. That's it. So, I, there is no really a big hype there. You just use whatever is good for you for pricing, and that's it. Most of them are working with SQL, easy, have APIs. This part is far more interesting with uh, graph databases and GPU databases. Have someone work with graph databases? Cool, you liked it? Yes. So the thing here, part of task in real life, it's a lot easier to visualize and understand in terms of graphs some verticals and edges with some measurements between them. Flows, directions, maps, what else? Uh, relations, like social network relations. They're far easier to understand a huge graph than a table representation. And this database is usually support different algorithms optimized for uh, graphs. If you were studying algorithms like Dijkstra, uh, graph search in depths, in whites, etc. Balance in a graph. They all support in that. And if you're able to make your business task close to a common algorithm, you don't need to, any, to do anything else. Just write a code that will create the graph and then run embedded algorithm for this database. You're getting an answer. And the problem here is that they listed OrionDB but forgot to list ArangoDB. Oracle IBM not free. Orient and ArangoDB interesting databases. They are column-based storage for huge data set. They are document storage and they are graph storage. So you deploy one instance that can store data in three different representations, depending on access pattern you use. It's extremely powerful. We used both. OrionDB is lagging, really. Support is not that good. I can recommend using Arango from experience, practical in high load project. <clears throat> and the last one is my love, really. Have someone heard from me about it? So data storage by its nature, it's again, really similar to uh, mathematic functions we do in models. Indexing, rebuilding ins, et cetera. So these operations are running much faster on GPUs. And these guys created instances of databases that are running on GPU, all indexing, all querying, all access to the data. They are so fast you cannot imagine. Like, Whenever you have a request to do, for example, geospatial analysis, like in a millisecond defined location, coordinates, functions, mathematical, it's killing it. Millisecond response for any data complexity. It's costly because of GPUs, but GPUs costly in general because of the <coughs> crypto miners. 
Yes, leaves nothing for data science. But on the other hand, I so much like them. Really, we, we had a hands-on with them because of the, we partnered with both of them. Really nice guys, they're trying to get to on top of the market. We believe that's the future technology for the database, especially when GPU costs go lower. So I do encourage to try it. They have demonstration. If you have video card in PC. And the same advice as I just told. On storages, questions? Have you noticed I haven't talked about your DBMS at all? They almost not use zero in big data. You use it only, mainly for metadata storage, highly structured metadata updates, user information, if it's like sessions to a site, and that's it. What about data marts? Data marts? Oh, there are cool stack. Uh, they haven't at all category for it. Uh, I would recommend. Um, I mean, it's not best practice, but sometimes uh, RDBMs can be used for creating oh. pre-aggregated, ready for analytics data. That was an approach taken to address the problem with uh, uh, normalization when the pattern access was getting uh, harder. So like it's one, one of the moves to data warehousing. But this column based document story, they just removed this problem at all. So you can play with it, but it's a lot of additional work. If you need complex analytics in a second, use uh, tools for it, like Druid. This one I can recommend from scratch. It already does something that you will be manually writing, like storage of the data, and then creating data marks on top of the data, but goes further. You insert data in Druid. You say this data should be combined, and it combines a cube from this data on a fly. And you have no delays with the data. You can use it in the manner you want. So it doesn't worth time right now already. You just, the whole mood goes like, stop trying to create something right new, just pick up the right tool. Most of it is already implemented, implemented. unless you wanna learn how it works underneath, then it's worth using. Are we on time? Even a bit faster. Search. <laughs> yes, the Jeff. Search is where everything started, as he said. <coughs> Initially, we needed to search in internet. We still need to search in internet. We need to search in logs. We need to search in text files, etc. It's still a matter, especially for you, if you need someone who's going to be working with. <coughs> Uh, text recognition is going to be essential. So two competitors here, Elastic and Solar. Solar is built on based on Lucene, like extending ideas of Lucene. They both good. We, we're using both, but you use each one depends on the pattern. <coughs> Elastic search is great when you need aggregation to calculate counts, sums, totals, etc., in the items you're searching. If you don't need it, solar might be better even, on the speed and ease of use. That's much you can say about these two tools, really. This market is a lot more centralized. And there is a Phoenix, extremely interesting project, created for Hadoop especially, and its a, idea is to mitigate the problem of uh, each base when you need it to access Pyrokey. When you use a Phoenix on top of Hadoop, you can work with each uh, base as with uh, relational database, in fact. It's not really right, but you can access by different fields, fields because it applies indexing to the data. But the problem is, 
if you write data through uh, Phoenix, you cannot then access this data from uh, HBase API anymore. You have to access it from Phoenix. But usually it doesn't add too much, like we're talking in milliseconds usually for data retrieval. So data retrieval from Phoenix can be 10, 10 milliseconds, 15. Depends on special complexity of query, but it works. So I do highly recommend them. Logs and monitoring, it's like growth of separate previous uh, search because you need to write logs, grab them, search what logs you need to grab, and then store it and visualize the data. And here is industry leading, whenever you go, first item here is ILCA. Elasticsearch, Kibana, Logstash, stack. That's it, like, right now there, there are competitors, I'm gonna list them, that's uh, Prometheus plus Grafana as well, but you as well can use Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Grafana, no problem. So, so you mix, you can mix and match them depending on your needs or which graphics you like more. I like Grafana, they have black ones, nice graphics really. We use them in, their, in our own product. So I like it a lot more. On the other hand, Fly, FluentD is a, a nice com open source competitor growing right now. But this guy, Splunk, if I had money, I'd buy it. It's expensive. But it does everything ELCA stack does and more. So whether you someone asks you for recommendation for monitoring, logging, etc., you can easily go with Plum. And they have money. If they don't, ELCA stack is to go wide. That's really it in this market. You don't need to discover anything else or write. And they're easy to use, really. And that's in by this. Why there is no Hmm? Data log? Haven't worked with it at all, really. They haven't even mentioned it here. They, yeah. they, they did Sentry. Yeah, but just if you say Splunk is separating from Splunk, Data log is expensive, but very good. Never had a chance. It's more, you know, like a lock. Who pay for them or not? And another question, because the hardest topic is ahead. Yeah. Maybe it's more question about money. But you're you're talking about this solution for business, not for yourself monitoring your smart house. You're talking about business. No, no, it's easy deployable. You can use your car for smart house. I mean about money. Business usually have money, and what problem is one? Depends on the business. Believe me, when you start working startup, you don't have money. That's a statement. Startup, you don't have money. We're talking about an enterprise. Your company only works only with startup. No, we was we working with enterprises, yeah. and and in this case, I want just well, I just interesting why you say that it it's too expensive for for enterprise or why? No, for enterprise, not expensive at all. It's it's expensive for our company to use, just on our own product. Oh. And for you, it's going to be expensive if you're not enterprise. That's it. For them, you can easily, that's why I say, if someone comes with your money, you can recommend Splunk and tell us a product that's been, been mentioned. But you won't use it at home. ILCA, you can use easily or in your product if it's needed. Dessert. Streaming. Streaming is cool and hard. Hard because it gives you a lot more challenge in comparing to batch processing. Jeff haven't touched this yesterday, but stream of data and stream of information, it's a lot more natural for us than a batch. If you start to think we created a batch, a, a set of information rows, for example, as an um, artificial limitation for the data because that was the way it was possible to process the data previously. And that's why everything else was built in batch. Like 
we consider data as a row of data. That's it. Single row that's installed, update time, etc. We consider everything else as an update. We consider that top from two is a time. But the information, it's a stream-based name. Most of the information is a stream. I'm talking, it's a stream of data. It exists and then disappears. And it creates tons of challenges, racing conditions. Jake will be talking about when, you know, the game when there are chairs, uh, just a simple example, chairs, nine chairs and 10 persons. And they run in against and start fighting for each chair. That's race condition. How do you avoid doing the same with your services? How do you avoid services fighting for the single chair and do, being more productive? Window operations, when you, we don't know when something happens to this window. What else? Exactly once, at least once delivery. When information I'm talking to you, I cannot guarantee exactly once delivery. I cannot guarantee you've got the information understood it. I can say at least once I told you that. That's it, it's at least once delivery. But I know like exactly once, etc. That's a lot of problems with streaming. That's why it changes the way you do it, uh, thinking, usually, about the problem. Some problems becoming trivial, really trivial. You don't even have to apply patterns from previous experience to it. Others become more solid. And here we have major players in streaming frameworks. Spark, Apex, Flink, Beam, Kafka, Druid, Storm. Druid is not really an engine for streaming. It's a storage that takes a streaming as an input. Can take it, streaming as an input, as well as NiPy and processes. Right here, mostly it's the companies. Data touring companies that took Apex and developing it. Databricks, what's it called? Yes, Confluent, Kafka. That's uh, creators of Kafka form the company. It's AWS, you know. This one I don't know at all. Set think about Storm already mentioned. Extremely cool and powerful uh, framework in lost in learning curves. It's really pity. And something that they missed there Lenses, Ignite, Kinesis, Rocksteady, NiFi, Sandler, Gearpump. Cool. And I haven't listed all other uh, streaming uh, engines from other uh, cloud providers. They all the same, mostly. What I can say from this set, lenses, it's a really interesting item. It's an abstraction over Kafka that gives you SQL access to cut tables. And you're going to understand how cool is that later in this class. We'll have a huge model on cast streams. That's, I'd say, the most powerful implementation of streaming processing right now. Uh, what else? Ignite and DB are in memory high, uh, low latency databases, distributed databases that keep state in memory. Kafka uses RocksDB underneath for storing data in its storage. Right now, they might be migrating from it, but uh, to Scylla, but right now it's RocksDB. Ignite does the same as well. Uh, Samza, it's also an engine for streaming processing based on Kafka, but it works with Kafka as with just a message bus mostly to process, while Kafka streams was unleash the power of Kafka. Kinesis, it's an interesting story. You took Kafka as a streaming processing framework, stream, stream, streaming framework and processing framework. Cut functionality in the half and you get AWS Kinesis. I don't know why they did it. I'm ready to kill them. And the reason is we have a project, the requirements was don't use the DevOps uh, tools. You don't, we don't want to hire DevOps. We used Kinesis. I hate the decision. You cannot move from it because it can do what Kafka has. It's so much overhead and burden to work with it. I can't tell you. 
And here I'll tell you what we are talking about complexity of uh, streaming. I found this as a good uh, representation of what's really essential it matters for streaming frameworks, how they be compared. Because scale is completely different to, for example, every Spark. Right here we talk about Spark streaming. That's a separate library. So as far as you see, in streaming we are talking about modals, how much you are processing in a time. If you see once one message in a time, that's real streaming. So we stream events as you go. Whenever you see pack of them, that's micro batch usually, like settled in a second window or half a second window, but still it's micro batch. Each, each of them has pros and cons, uh, for example, but you cannot do in Spark streaming items you will be able to do in Kafka streams, which are joint streams. A really hard concept, but when you get it, I don't know, you can nail down any streaming task. Latencies. In streaming, we are talking about milliseconds. And I'm not kidding. Like, if you have 48 milliseconds, it's bad. If you have 5 to 15, it's good. It sounds crazy, it's all beneath one second, right? But when you have hundreds of thousands of these messages, these milliseconds count. Throughput is killing me on a single node. That's simple messages, not really complicated usually, but 100,000 messages per second on a single node, that's a cool one. That's something I always dream to work with initially, especially when you start, I started to work with databases for the BMS in their low, slow speed. And then this concept, Jeff gonna be talking about, at least once delivery, exactly once delivery, etc. It really matters because in one thing, you can be sure about information being delivered, in other, you might not. For some projects, it doesn't matter. For some, it's critical. Example for stock market, you haven't received a tick of a price of a share spiked. You lost a million, just just a tick in millisecond. That's it. Language support and anything else. Good example of use cases. Which one support what? Cool for Samza. Joins and later it's been added to Kafka streams. Again, it's just spoiler for further discussion. Reprocessing is a matter in uh, streaming because whether you usually you need an opportunity to reprocess everything. In modern approach to design of architecture of the system, you don't really pay attention how you write you pay attention how you reprocess it because you wrote it doesn't matter we, we calculated something different we can easily reprocess it every time without change of state of the system and now my beloved table i doubt you can see anything here link is here i really like recommend whenever you start thinking what to try Open it. First item, take attention where it's being deployed. For you, it's critical because if you use this methods, you cannot use systems that work only on the R. Next one, language support. Here, again, my beloved Storm. On its release, it supported the most pro languages you can imagine, and still, it's not adopted that well. What, Spark streaming, Kafka streams, Java, yeah. Java and Scala, by the way. It's a bit outdated, so, but nothing better, it's still on the internet. It's a, that's the most complete overview of infrastructure. Your recommendation on that? Questions on streaming? All clear or nothing is clear. My major idea is to, to explain streaming is different, really different. Don't try to apply uh, 
stereotypes, patterns that you know to streaming. Just think of it as a new book. A little new book. Then you're going to enjoy it, really. Because when you understand that you can process two million messages in a few seconds, and it's linearly scalable because of distributed nature of all frameworks, you understand that its, its powers are limitless. And like example from it, you can start processing real-time video, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So when we use when we use streaming, how do we track what we have delivery, what messages delivered, but how we track messages processed? Because we can post messages, but we can do not compare with the processing and the messages delivered. Most of them have. Uh, 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 most frameworks that are distributed are fault tolerance or have support of fault tolerance to some case. Most of them save their state somewhere. If you're talking, for example, Kafka stream, they save their state continuously in RocksDB. So chance of losing data is minimized because even on a drop of the message, the state is being restored immediately on another node. So we run our code on their like, cluster or execution? You always run, uh, you always, that's the concept of whole distribution logic. Remember, you, Jeff, yesterday, the shift was you not running data to the code. You deploy code to the data and then run it. So you deploy cluster, for example, this engine, is the place where data stored is, and run it there. Yeah, but if, if you have streaming, the data falls to our servers. Yes, so actually, from cluster. Yeah, from cluster. So actually this code is backed by some Kafka framework or whatever. Not just Kafka. For you, you may use Kafka as a messaging platform and you can use uh, another engine Storm, for example, to process it. Both have full tolerance. I mean, this is responsibility of the framework to track. They both. And, and the tool that delivers the message and the system that process it. So you can always rely on the data in Kafka or other framework. And as well as you can rely on the framework. It doesn't need already to, to really to take so much care about it. So that's the power of the distribution. Cool pictures. You know why AWS diagrams are the most popular and available on the internet? No? no they provided their uh, icons to all, to all tools that do drawings. That's why it's <laughs> easier to draw in AWS than in any other cloud. Simple solution, yeah? Business. Schema of data processing from trading, uh, Forex trading platform done by our company. What it does, it takes real-time data from trading, ticks changes of uh, currency changes in milliseconds. In seconds, there can be 100 ticks per each currency, but usually not, can be. On, on dollar it is, dollar, main, main trading currency, dollar, euro, etc. This client wanted to have it all on AWS without DevOps. Like, that's why we paid him for this part. He needs the streams. They're so much limited and used only as a moving pipeline for data. Then we use Hadoop distribution MR cluster with, to run Spark streaming jobs on it to process the data in real time. I'm showing right here right, how all system are tied together. So on the input we have data from trading, on the output we have a UI from a user that has real time data ticking in real time and have uh, some visualization with minor delay. In fact, that is, you can call a Lambda architecture. When you enrich the latest data, uh, historical data with the latest one. So stream part provides last hour data. Batch layer provides from the beginning, like five years ago, T minus one. Then they all merge together on a dialogue. Getting back. All analytics, all calculations, uh, quantiles, uh, data science uh, models are run, executed here. 
jobs are being scheduled using Uzi, if needed, uh, to have some kind of, if there is a workflow. Elastics, uh, elastic cache from Amazon, based on Elasticsearch, used as in memory database. Right. All data that we received is being dropped from using Kinesis Amazon Firepost S3 bucket, raw data. Cool thing about uh, big data systems that they removed this uh, previous limitation when you had to cut data, like give it a structure and then stick into the system. What it removed, it's removed the opportunity later for data scientists to find this relations between some data that previously was unrelated for some people. Right now, it's a good manner to store all your raw data. Storage does not cost that much comparing to previous time. So really, we store all ticks for all currencies. And then was one of the advantages. They know it's going to grow tremendous in a year. But still, it's already big data. Everything that we process, we also dropped us through buckets, through Firefox, I can grow this here. Is that the same cache, just for use? Something that we gonna, that we need to process in and need some specific pattern of access. Past stored in elastication memory, other stored in DynamoDB. All metrics calculated, everything else, parameters, list of active uh, uh, queries, latest requests, etc. That is where the system ends, and only the API level deals with these two systems to retrieve the data to drive. Data scientists work here using Asina, then the Jupyter notebook, whatever you want to use. It's a SQL like syntax to access the data. That's the logic. So what data scientists do, they access the data here, train the models looking for uh, uh, dependencies. Whenever they have it ready, they compile it in terms of library code, etc. Provide engineers and deploy it in the workflow here. And then data received from engine can be run through another model, be it Usually it's uh, forecasting models or analytical models for scoring some extended. What problems you see with architecture? Because I can name a few. I'm not sure that data scientists provide very good uh, and efficient what to run on the big amount of data. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Usually data engineers Rewrite it. But if data scientist is really good in experience, they can write really nice code. It's still is Spark, you know, and Spark is more familiar. The problem is it's Spark streaming. It's a bit different to a common Spark. And the problem with it, you cannot write it on PySpark. Python for streaming is bad. I hate to tell you that, but it's mm -hmm. true. It's limited on API. Uh, why do you use a uh, WebSocket connection between the uh, Spark applications and the, the others? Uh, because you can use Protobuf or something like that, I suppose. UI team doesn't know how to use hmm? UI team doesn't know how to use But that. you can transform <laughs> uh, Protobuf, uh, Protobuf stream between these two WebSocket Ideal connections. situation was ideal. It's mm -hmm. extremely good question. To use Kinesis stream on an exit <laughs> to cast from after the job, output of the job cast to, uh, to a stream and UI reading the stream. That was really the, the event driven output there. It was the best alternative at the cost, the, the, at least cost. But they don't know how to use it. They know, that, you know the requirement, we need WebSocket. Sometimes the best ideas and, you know, Solutions can be just blocked by li limitations of others. And other thoughts? I'll sh also show you one. Too much storages. This, this, and this oh, is the same one. They can be combined. 
HBase can do that. On that speed, HBase can work, but HBase is not supporting the service. Again, something to really worry about. With the right design of a key, we can get the same output speed as Elastic Cache. But we forced to use with this limitation to different instances. And it's bad because in Elastic, you keep one data set uh, in Elastic Cache and in DynamoDB other data set. And we don't keep everything in DynamoDB because it's damn expensive. So if you're gonna keep everything as a cache in DynamoDB, you, you, your bill gonna grow tremendously. You have to use data that's less changed, as less changes, but need to be accessed fast. Everything else in Elastic. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys, let's move to another <laughs> example. Data Lake. Who knows what Data Lake is? Not interesting in someone else. Okay, then few words, just not so boring. The history of storages. As I already mentioned previously, the cost of storage data was high, really high. And we were thinking about what's the best way to squeeze the data. The normalization theory approach that gives you, force to create keys, foreign keys, get the tables output, link them together. It was really good solutions to make the data smaller, but it made problems later when the amount of data was growing and business was asking for more and more complex analytics and data access. They wanted, give me a report on 10 years. It's already was killing normalized database. The next step was to do data warehouse. They said, okay, screw it. Let's do denormalization. Let's decrease normalization. It helped, but just for what, 10 years or so? And then the amount of data growth. Data warehouses are slow as hell, especially when they are big, because they still use normalized structure in the tables. And to get normalized structure, we have to cut some piece of information. If you have logs, you cut part of the logs because you don't need message, some part of message, etc. And then you might be missing some valuable information. So with the decrease cost, the new product merged. Why the hell we're analyzing and formatting data before we write it to storage? Let's just store everything. Like everything that counts. In, initially, it was like, no way, we'll blow everyone. But with the decrease of cost, it was it became real. Right now, data lakes are real. They completely remove data, removing data warehousing. The problem is you don't want to get to data swamp when you stored everything, and now it's a mess. You don't know where information is, right? You still need to keep some level of order but it's still like a lake. It's maybe the same cluster. You just keep the structure of folders that's needed, like marketing, sales, etc. And that's it. Data lake will work. And the item is development data lake is essential because after that, you can give data scientists a data lake. They'll swim. You have everything you need to, to do analytics. Like everything, you can't say we, we lost some data. Right now, all data is here. And this example of these tools help to create this data lake. Problem is data lakes, they grow tremendously. Like they're huge. Nothing being archived so far. Like if you have data like running for two years, it's petabytes. Uh, Walmart generates 20 terabytes of data every hour and stores it and analyzes. Can you imagine the level of speed of growth of their lakes? Even though the lakes are distributed, like logistics, etc. What do we have here? Uh, RESTful API. For data lake, what's good, you don't really need this uh, streaming 
uh, tool set because the speed of data update is not that fast. You just dump the date. You just need speed of write, good speed of write. Uh, well, how well implemented there? It's not our project. We did it kind of different way, but I can share. API gateway to access the data. That's been on S3. AWS Lambda. It's analogs of service less microservices from AWS to deal with data calls. And Asana has already mentioned to access the data that's being stored through API S3. They name a DB for metadata. CloudWatch for logs, that's permissions, that's for monitoring. And Active Directory is for access. Any questions? It's kind of common. Uh, Azure, or Azure provides, sorry, never pronounced it right provides their own implementation of data lake right away. Like they have complete data lake solution SSRs. You just dump there. You no, know, like throw in shuffle date and it stores it. Fun, but not, but pricey. Even for business. Next one, real time processing on example of tweets. We need streaming. And by the way, this is interesting for you. Because that's something you will have to use in a project. Some, you will have to design an architecture to process streaming application. Yura will tell about more about it on some cloud. Uh, we have a message input that goes for Kafka streams. Spark consumes some topics and provides real-time dashboard. And I doubt they should, you should use Spark streaming here, not Spark. Spark will get you delayed. If you don't want delay, use Spark stream. So you know, Kafka has a concept of uh, streams that you can consume, subscribe and consume. So different data you can uh, send to different streams. Uh, Spark streaming is enrichment, like you get in scores to a tweet based on model designed by data scientists. Publish it in another Kafka stream or directly to Spark Shop. Spark engine trains and reinforce the data and drops it on as another topic to a cup. Example of reinforced term, uh, real time process. This one is hard, especially you need to, not really need, but it's uh, good to create a model that's going to be tra trained or process fast. Next, and the last one, because you might be tired, it's video streams processing for smart houses. Kafka, I have to say that Kafka is a common standard or just to go solution, if not a standard. Spark, easy to use. As you see, they also store data, raw data in S3 storages. Exactly. Aggregate the data, publish to Kafka, another Spark job that does real-time dashboards and alerts. If you notice the pattern uh, with the streaming applications, there is a pattern. So we have a bus that has different messaging uh, topics and all consumers subscribe to some and publish to another. In that way, you get the real implementation of microservice infrastructure when deploy of a service doesn't break the system and redeploy the service. Increases version. They are being independent. Their contract being implemented on base of messages they do in Kafka. And Kafka as well have an evolutional schema. He'll, as will tell you and show you that. That can, uh, does development based on changes of your type of message. That's it. Hope something was helpful in this talk.
I do wish you a nice weekend and I do hope you're gonna like the course.